the dinosaur really symbolizes the reality of the extinction of species. Uh, the idea that 90% of the things that have lived on this planet are no longer around. You, know, you can't find them except through paleontology, which tries to reconstruct what is lost. But the dinosaur is the figurehead of that whole uh, story, the modern scientific story of extinction. Before Cuvier in 1790, nobody knew this. They thought all the living things are still with us from the creation. And we still have creationists today, you know, who uh, say, oh, you know, no, the dinosaurs, they, they died uh, because Noah built a second ark for them. And they went down in a storm. They drowned. Um, the, the, but uh, so that's their alternate myth. But I do think the fascination with dinosaurs really has to do with not just I am going to die. Everybody recognizes that. You know, I'm not forever. But all, all of my people, my kind, the human race itself could disappear, could go the way of the dinosaurs. And that is you know, it's hard to grasp what that would mean. Uh, so that's why I think they are deeply mysterious because they were world dominant, like we are world dominant. That's why I think my fundamental premise was dinosaurs are us. We look at them and we use them as a mirror to understand uh, our own condition. Well, I think all all the scientific disciplines uh, are constituted by power. Uh, political power, um, sometimes military power, uh, technological uh, inequality, wealth inequality. Uh, so, the, and to that extent, they colonize the world automatically. Not that that's always a terrible thing, but it's, uh, it strikes me as built into uh, the idea of knowing something. When you know something, you at least have the feeling that you have mastered it, you control it, somehow now it belongs to you. And I think one of the frontiers of the theory of knowledge now, today, is to uh, resist that as the automatic framework of knowledge, so that you put into question your own certainty, uh, put into question the grounds of your knowledge. Uh, and it's a way of checking, for one thing, against error, having left out uh, enormous amounts of things you should have known, uh, a way of letting in what you might have screened out before and said, that's just noise, or that's only fantasy, or that's only fiction. Uh, this is why I think the sciences and, and the humanities in the academy have to talk to each other very seriously not uh, just think of you know two culture split where the scientists do their science humanists do their study of culture and society um, it strikes me that decolonizing uh, works in both sides and that it, it's especially good and powerful when they come together around it that's why to me sciences like paleontology were so were such a, a ripe place to explore that idea. We imagine extinction as a possibility all the time. Science fiction has been imagining it forever, of a catastrophic, uh, you know, like a, uh, our planet being wiped out, either by aliens arriving or by a meteorite, something like that. Uh, all of that has been easy to imagine. But imagining the end of capitalism, that's maybe utopian, but uh, very hard to imagine as a global uh, uh, thing. So, and that's why I think it's very dangerous because capitalism, in my view, it, if it is not restrained and regulated, it produces an inevitable extinction. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I mean, it'll be preceded by a breakdown of civilization, mm -hmm. gated communities, massive displacement of people. We're already seeing it. Yeah. Uh, transformations in the climate that affect millions of people and then a few people will try to make a Noah's Ark. I think the rich are already doing that. Uh, 
So it's, yeah, it's, it's really connected. That's why the dinosaur is the emblem of capitalism itself, uh, so existently, and particularly of uh, not the commodity fetish in Marxist term, but the commodity totem, uh, you know, where we uh, make a kind of cult around this thing, which is telling us stories we don't want to hear. Mm. But this, uh, there was a passage in here. Um, and this was based on the, the reports in the 19th century, in the 1870s, um, that there were legends about large animal bones among the Plains Indians. The big bones found in the bluffs of Nebraska and Dakota were thought to, by the Sioux to be the remains of the Umtehi, subterranean and subaquatic giants and reptilian monsters who were big enough to eat men and whose appearance would make one go crazy or blind. Uh, the Untehi were sometimes described as huge oxen or as giant rattlesnakes with legs, and their destroyers were the sky gods, especially the Thunderbird. Uh, despite their archaic ancient pedigree, the Untehi were often depicted with modern metaphors. Its backbone is like a cross-cut saw being flat and notched like a cogwheel. Its den is constructed of iron. Uh, one legendary sighting makes the water monster sound like a familiar spectacle on the Missouri in the 1870s. Long ago, the people saw a strange thing in the river. At night, there was some red object shining like fire, making the water roar as it passed upstream. Given the catastrophic results for Indians of the arrival of the iron horse and the paddle wheel steamboat, it's hard to see their perception that these monsters uh, as Untehi was a mistake. So this is why I think uh, th uh, this was just reported from uh, the Native Americans, from the Sioux Indians who the geological survey, they interviewed people. They got these, these stories, but there must be much more. These are the stories that uh, Lenny's great-grandfather, perhaps, uh, was telling. You know, I think the museums have uh, at least two projects. One is to promote knowledge, to preserve knowledge, uh, and the other is to draw in people, to uh, attract people to see it. Um, and, uh, but I think those projects are connected, uh, that you want people to come for with a thirst for knowledge, that they, they will understand something that hasn't been clear before. And that's why the, the museum itself has to revolutionize itself. Uh, it has to rethink its own foundations. And the, the study of, um, of dinosaur representation in natural history museums is especially crucial because it is the great attraction. It's, it's supposed to represent scientific knowledge on the one hand, and it's supposed to be a spectacle. Uh, that's why the McDonald's Hamburger Corporation, you know, chooses the dinosaur as an advertising animal. Uh, so, and it, the other thing the museum does is it separates cultural knowledge from scientific knowledge. You know, the anthropologists are here, paleontologists are here. I want to bring them together, make them collide, say, you know, and to think of that key concept, the totem. The, the, you have these objects which are mysterious, attractive, symbolic, filled with meaning. Uh, the, the, the cultural scientists have their view, the, uh, the, the natural scientists have their view, and then there's also the public that comes and then the people from the places that gather these, because they, these are imperial museums. They have it. It's there's, it's not an insult to say they are the products of colonialism. That's just a plain fact. So that whole history needs to be brought forward and uh, made part of this. So I think that natural history museums would they would become so much more interesting if that was. That kind of uh, maelstrom or vortex of interest was activated. You know, when you have an institution and you have a budget and an annual and a board of trustees and so forth, and you 
have persisted for 100, 200 years, it's not easy to say, okay, we're going to really shake up everything we do here. Uh, but th that's why I think what you're doing is so important because uh, you're not asking the museum to turn itself upside down, but you are doing a kind of intervention in the museum. And I think this is what artists are really good at. They can come in and say, let's just make, put a, you know, come in at an angle and create a disturbance, but a, a productive disturbance, one that it doesn't just make a mess, it makes an interesting kind of transformation in the way people look at things. To say to them, we want to decolonize your collection, that sounds like, oh, you want to attack us. I say, no, we, your collection is is dead and dying. It's because it doesn't reflect on its own foundations. Let's just look at what's under the ground, what you do. Uh, it'll be good for you. <laughs> I mean, the idea of total mastery, total knowledge is a phantasm. Uh, and I try to distinguish between what I would call science and the scientific method and what you might call scientism. Scientism to me is an ideology that says science is about certainty. But I think uh, the best scientists I know are ones who say, no, we don't have certainty. We have maybe high probability, we have reasons, we have uh, evidence, and, but our conclusions are always provisional. This is why I, Freud, in, uh, in his reflections on the question of whether psychoanalysis was a Weltanschauung, he said, uh, no, it's not. And in, in that respect, it is a science because it accepts uncertainty, accepts provisional hypothetical knowledge. Uh, that doesn't mean it's just anything goes. Uh, on the contrary, it means that it's a project and uh, a struggle to, to know. And part of that struggle is questioning your own premise, uh, looking at your own ground with what foundation are you building from. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think, that's again what decolonizing uh, means. The, the questioning the ground you've built on. The, uh, this is true especially in in architecture, I've, I've been interested in the last few years in this project called Decolonizing Architecture, which asks the question, yeah, whose ground is it you're building on? And what is under that ground? Uh, it's, uh, what, what are the foundations? And, uh, so this is true of the museum. Uh, it's true of the academy, uh, and the, the uh, academic disciplines as well. It's a very precarious difficult um, kind of a narrow path you have to walk well, because I think good science always questions itself it always tests and then uh, re-examines uh, but climate change is the perfect example you can always find some people who uh, are merely skeptical Say, you know, no, no, it's not, uh, I, don't, I don't believe it, they call them, uh, there's two kinds. One is the climate change skeptics who claim to speak for science, and then there's the climate change deniers, like Donald Trump, who says climate change is just a myth, it was uh, invented by the Chinese for their own political purposes. Now that, to me, is out of bounds. I think that deserves no hearing whatsoever. Uh, it's a paranoid uh, fantasy, crazy, and uh, it tries to, uh, it, it, with, with the skeptics on the other hand, sometimes you know, they, they raise a question which is legitimate. Uh, they say, uh, because there's two different questions with climate change. First is, is it happening? And I think the answer is clearly yes. Mm -hmm. All the evidence points that way. Uh, the, and it's caused by human beings, that's the second uh, uh, premise. We are in a new uh, geological epoch called the Anthropocene. Uh, and then there's that third question, what do we do about it? And some people say, well, it's too late. 
to do anything about it. We just have to adapt and write it out. So that's where interesting debates, I think, start, is with the question of what, uh, what to be done. Uh, so it, even though I think basically it's settled science very, uh, uh, and I don't doubt it, that climate change is real, the question of what exactly to do, uh, and one answer seems absolutely sure, and that's uh, we have to restrain, uh, limit the use of fossil fuels. That's, uh, I think, almost universally accepted. Except, of course, by the fossil fuel industry, which stands to lose a lot of money. But they have known it for a long time, the, uh, that uh, the, the oil industry and the consumption of oil uh, was doing disastrous things to the air uh, and the water. And uh, they continue to deny it. And they hire, there's always a scientist for hire who will say, oh, well, you know, well, I have doubts, I have doubts. And they build it on that kind of, uh, of doubt. I wanted to go to, um, uh, to Utah to interview elders, but I had no connection to do it. And so I went through anthropologists, and they said, this is not the time. Mm -hmm. So hmm. I could have just gone, I suppose, and said, hi, hello, you know. They would say. <laughs> Today I would, uh, I would go to Standing Rock, and I would uh, yeah, meet with Denny, uh, and I would say, uh, can we talk? Uh, I want to hear Denny's stories. I mean, I think that's the great unwritten chapter of my book. Uh, I went up to the point of asking uh, anthropologists, have you talked to Native Americans about their beliefs and their stories, uh, their knowledge of these bones that are in, in their land and have been there for you know, a long time? And, uh, you know, what are the ghosts of these bones? You know, they, uh, what stories? I got just a little bit of that. I got enough to see that um, there was a whole body of knowledge there, uh, but that it was only scratching the surface. So I, uh, I think that would be the additional chapter, exactly.